right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Mike Knaven Podcast, episode 119. Yes, 119. Wow, we're deep into uh, deep into this show now, four years. I know I sound like a broken record, but sometimes I really can't believe the episode count that we've gotten to in such a relatively short amount of time. If you haven't checked out the previous episode, that was with a friend of mine, Ali Bauman, who's a reporter for CBS New York. Ali talked about growing up not too far from me in Western Connecticut. I'm based in New Haven, of course, and her dream of getting to New York City becoming realized. She's a Syracuse grad and has done great work on Channel 2. So if you haven't watched that, uh, please go do so. She's a very nice girl, and I was glad that we spoke. So this episode is a continuation of a miniseries that um, is one of three that we have within the show. Of course, you know, there's Tales from the Boom Room, which is profiles of the NYPD's arson explosion and bomb squad. There is the best of the bravest, interviews with the FDNY's elite. And today, volume six of the E-Men inside the NYPD's emergency service unit with my next guest, who spent 21 years out of his life giving all he had to a city that certainly requires all you got. Joining the NYPD in 1981, he would eventually climb through the ranks and join the emergency service unit. And later on, will become inspector in command of the entire unit and led the unit during some of its darkest chapters, including the events of 9-11. And that, excuse me, for volume six is retired NYPD inspector Ron Wasson, who joins us for the E-Men inside the NYPD emergency service unit. Inspector Wasson, great to have you. How are you? Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. All right. So the first question is always an easy one. Where'd you grow up? I grew up on Long Island, Rockville Center, a little uh, town outside of Queens, about 20 minutes from the line and uh, had a great time. I was, uh, I originally, my parents were from Brooklyn and moved out to Rosedale and then eventually moved out to Rockville Center in the early 60s. So that's where I spent my, uh, that's where I grew up. Uh, do you guys, uh, you guys, rather, do you uh, come from a background in which there's civil servants in your family or were you the first in your family to go into law enforcement? Actually, yeah, actually, um, my uncle was a an inspector in the NYPD, Frank Conley, very well known uh, to the a lot of the older uh, officers. He ran a school called Police Tutorial Service. And if you were studying or seriously looking to be promoted, he ran the school's uh, ran the school that a lot of a lot of people went to and it was kind of funny when I eventually did become a police officer a lot of people would say you know I kind of know I feel like I know you and my first question is did you go to PTS and he says oh my god you're the, you know you're the guy who was always screwing up so I had to, I had to tell my uncle I said you gotta you gotta stop making Watson a screw up because everybody's gonna think that <laughs> uh, when I uh, when I come into work so and you started that's my, and that's my experience uh, no one ever told me, uh, like, I wish I could tell you, oh, I wanted to be a cop from the time, uh, you know, when I was little, I always looked up to my uncle, but it wasn't really something and, you know, that, that was in my, in my mindset. We're talking with Rod Watson here. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. This is volume six of the E-Men inside the NYPD's emergency service unit. A lot of people were really excited that I was going to be having him on. And so I look forward to uh, publishing the show and, and getting it out to all of you, the audience. So Joined the NYPD in 81, like I covered before, there's transit, there's housing, and then there's the city. So you went to the city, you didn't have to go to transit or housing. Um, I imagine living close to Queens, did you start out in Queens or did you start out somewhere else? Actually, I started in, in, in Brooklyn. Uh, when you come out of the academy, you really don't have much of a choice where they sent you. And uh, I wound up in NSU 15, which covered uh, the 83 precinct, the 90, and the 94, which is uh, Greenpoint. Greenpoint being the nicest one, uh, Williamsburg, the 9 was a little, was busier, and the 8-3 was pretty, pretty busy, too. Brooklyn North generally is a busy place, a lot of action. It was, uh, um, you know, if you're a cop, you were going to learn your trade pretty quick. I imagine. So let's spend some time on an NSU, because for my listeners that may not know, the NYPD, I don't know if they still have these, but back then they certainly did, and that is a neighborhood stabilization unit where usually younger cops go and hone their craft. So what exactly are the duties of an NSU? And as far as field training officers, who would you credit most as teaching you the job? Well, NSU, as you said, it's uh, the first, it's the first contact that you're really going to have everything. And it was really funny. Everything I felt I learned in the academy and I loved the academy. Not a lot of people didn't like it. I really liked it. I knew from the moment I walked in to be to go through the investigation process, I knew I was in the right place. It was just, you know, everything about it I liked. So you wind up in NSU 15 and they pair, they would pair you up generally with a detective 
and you would be, uh, there would be two rookies in the front seat, the detective would be in the back, and he would respond with you to certain calls for service. And um, I would say uh, my detective that who, who I to train, I trained most with was a uh, detective Norman Horowitz. Uh, his nickname was Seaweed. He had a very bad uh, perm for some reason, and he liked to leave the windows open. We trained when we came out of the academy, it was in the summer. And uh, he used to love to ride around uh, the 90 precinct and where the people would open up the fire hydrants. He would intentionally leave the window down and drive slowly through and just soak the car and anybody in it. So that's that was his thing. And uh, everybody knew him. And uh, it was it was really a very enlightening uh, uh, training training for me. I can remember the first time, the first call that I came over, you know, man with the gun. And I kind of remember sitting like, okay, we're going to him. It was no big deal. To me, it was just trying to not look like scared out of my mind because this is the first time you're really going to be responding. It turned out to be unfounded, but that whole like 40 second ride to that location was, it was terrifying. But over over time, you actually kind of get used to those things, and you're they te- you know it was just like there were times we did go to jobs where somebody was running around with a gun, and it was that that process of getting you over what you should do. Um, there's the academy way or the book way, but it's not always necessarily relates to what actually happens on the street. So Norman was very good, or Norm. Uh, he later became a detective lieutenant in Brooklyn North. Uh, homicide and he, he was fantastic great great guy but that was my experience in any shoe and that's why you hear the term i think the highest honor that you can give any cop besides saying he's a cop's cop is calling a cop a street cop because if you're saying a cop's a street cop it's not just giving out eh, he works the streets and the street crime unit no it means he's an act or she's an active guy or gal going out there doing the grunt work in calls like this and really, even though they're obviously very aware of the danger and they don't you know, do things that are against procedure that could compromise safety, they're in their element working costs like this. So working with a guy like that, I mean, you had to feel, even if it was terrifying, like you just described, you had to feel a little bit reassured having somebody like that by your side. Oh, uh, absolutely. And you know what? The, the people in the neighborhood knew him. So, you know, he, he, when he showed up in the scene, you know, there was a recognition that he was there, you know, like. It, it was it was comforting, I guess, to know uh, he knew what he was doing. And, um, you know, everybody that rotated through his uh, his training, I think, would have to say the same thing. He you know, he was the guy that he was a good talker, but he walked the walk. I mean, you weren't going to get over on him. Uh, and that was really a part of the experience, how to talk to people, you know, kind of feel when you were being, you know, they weren't people weren't being honest with you. And uh, that was you, you couldn't that, that stuff you can't really teach in an academy. You can only see it when you're involved in it right up, up close and personal. So, you know, you talked about working in Brooklyn during the 80s, and I've covered this with a lot of guys who started out there. I mean, it was busy, busy with the capital B. You had a lot going on during the 80s and early 90s, especially if you worked in the neighborhoods you described or if you were in the seven five where the old saying used to be, well, you, you give us 22 minutes, we'll give you a homicide. So, oh, yeah. You know, working during a time like that, I mean, most cops and most first responders, period, want quiet days. And I get it. It's not an easy job, especially in a city like that. But for a young guy coming on the job at the time, were you kind of glad you were in a busy area? Because there's more time and there's more opportunities to own your craft. Do you know, um, you're 100% correct. I've always been very fortunate to a lot of people when they when they hear you go went to the seven five or the nine zero or um, you know East East New York uh, Bedford Stuyvesant they would say oh they felt bad for you in the long in the long over the span of my career it is, it's really served me well because you had that experience to fall back on and then people knew in the police department if you had come from those areas you were really there was really no places to hide out, you know, in the seven, five and the eight, three, the seven, nine, uh, you really, you, you really had to do your work and you got known your reputation, you earn it very easily and it stays with you a long time. And if you're, you're a good cop, that reputation follows you. It should follow you. And, uh, I found that saying I was from the seven, five at one time, actually, when I, when I had, 
was promoted to captain, I was actually supposed to go to Queens and I got kind of bumped out and I wound up going to the seven five. I said, but in, in retrospect, it was the greatest thing that ever happened because the commanding officer was Joe Dunn, who later became the first deputy police commissioner. And, uh, you know, at the time, you couldn't have somebody training you better. Brooklyn North was loaded with these fantastic precinct commanders. The next one I worked for was uh, Joe Esposito. I think you probably know that name. Steven Department. So, you know, I was really fortunate and it was just happenstance. And that learning experience helped me, I think, so, so much in what I became as a, uh, as I moved up in the ranks too. So. This is volume six of the E-Men inside the NYPD's emergency service unit. And our guest today is retired inspector Ron Wasson. So tell me about getting to ESU. I mean, you're in Brooklyn, so there's three trucks in ESU. For context for my listeners, and I've said this before, but if you, if you haven't heard it, there's 10 trucks throughout the city. And there's different mini squads. They have Floyd Bennett Field. They have the apprehension team, which goes out and handles high-risk warrants. But in Brooklyn, you have truck six, truck seven, and truck eight, if I have that correct. So, you know... For ESU, for you, it's an exciting place to be. You're a young guy. Was that why you wanted to be there, just a level of action? Well, to be honest with you, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a funny story. Uh, when I was a, a young cop, I remember being assigned to the 7-9 precinct in Bed-Stuy. And uh, I remember seeing the large rescue truck go past and looking up or, and seeing those guys and saying, man, I wonder what you have to do to get to that, to, to be in that type of a unit. And this is just as a rookie. And then over the course of the next year and a half, I used to see these emergency guys pull up, put a vest on, just two, two officers go in and, you know, like everybody was waiting for them and they would like the sea would part. They'd kick in the door and get the bad guy. And I said, you know, that's something I really wanted to do. Fast forward a couple of years later, now I'm, I'm, I'm in my first precinct and the uh, one of the guys who, who worked there, um, went into emergency service and it's, I'm not sure if it's still that way now, but before you could get into emergency service, somebody really had to vouch for you. Somebody in the unit that either knew you, knew your reputation. Um, and you that name went on the top of your application. So you wouldn't really get even a shot unless somebody said, Hey, that, that guy's worth looking at. You still had to pass an interview and go through a bunch of things, psychological, heavy weapons training, you know, review, but just to get that really initial that you were, you know, worthy of, you know, even getting that interview, that's how it happened for me. So somebody who went to my precinct and he says, you know what, I know Watson and, and, and he's, you know, he's, he's making a lot of arrests. He's, he's active. He's backing people up. That's, and that's how it happened. Matter of fact, when I went to the interview, it was very short. I remember being interviewed by uh, a Sergeant Baker and at that time, a Lieutenant Adams, and they were kind of, they, they treated me very harshly. They actually said, what do you think? Why do you think with three and a half years, you can even be sitting here? And uh, they asked me like two questions. Uh, Lieutenant Adams at the time just yelled at me saying that, you know, uh, you're single and you, you guys, you know, it's not overtime. And he just yelled at me. Uh, they asked me literally just one question. If they asked me anything about rescue, I probably wouldn't have been able to answer them. I walked out and I said, oh, my God, that was awful. And the next guy I hear going in, I'm sitting there and there, I can hear some laughter in the interview. I got in. He didn't. I don't understand how that happened. But uh, and that's that's basically how it went. And then it went down to Floyd Bennett Field to start my training. I know John Lampkin described this to me previously, and I know it's definitely like this now. ESU Academy is six months, which is good because if you're going to be doing that kind of work, um, you know, you got to have as much training as possible. Back then, it was significantly shorter. So you're talking about cramming all this training in, which is helpful training, obviously, and in such a short amount of time. You know, you really got to be on your, your P's and Q's for that. So take me through ESU Academy for you and just that process in a shorter time span. It, you know what, what it, what it has become, it really is an elite academy. Uh, it's six months. I think it's even longer than that now. So when you walk out the door, you know, you are an EMT. You have a building collapse specialty. You're a high rise. You can rig and do high rise rescue. Um, they, you, you, you can rip a car apart. You, you can, um, I mean, it just everything gets covered over that time. 
my experience, and it was uh, 15 to 18 of us that went through the training, it was in a tiny room in the back of a, this, this hangar, which became the training, a, 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 the training academy eventually. But there was a Sergeant Riley who I think was in trouble, uh, uh, Tom Riley and two other guys, this guy, Jeff Kelch, and another guy, Frank McIntosh. And they really, you know, I think every day you came in, they gave you something different to do. Uh, it was definitely shorter. We did do, you know, hearse tool training and EMT training. Uh, but the level of stuff, things that they have to do now, there was no hazmat training. I mean, hazmat training was, hey, don't if, if you see a smoking barrel, don't go near it. Um, a lot of effort, a lot of training went into tactical training. Uh, emergency service does get a lot of accolades for rescue. But at the end of the day, they're a tactical unit that has to go in and do high risk hostage saving, you know, barricaded perpetrators, uh, you know, contract killers that they, they have to get, uh, you know, take into custody, uh, often with outside agencies like the FBI and, uh, you know, governmental agencies, they call us and they say, we need to get this guy, this is where he is, and you guys go and get him for us. Uh, that was a lot of our training, which, you know, over time, I think we're, we're pretty good at. Um, at one point, Los Angeles Police Department came to our, to our training because they said, we don't understand how you handle so many emotionally disturbed people, but you never seem to have to kill any of them. Or, you know, it's very rare that, that you, a firearm was needed. In LA, LA, they were, you know, it was, they would use their firearms a lot. So, you know, we have an expertise, I think really gets overlooked a lot of times, you know, especially today, you know, how much emphasis is on that non-lethal or that wait people out or get them, take them into custody without actually, uh, you know, hurting them or worse killing them. And that's what I love about ESU amongst many things, which is why I really want to talk to so many of you guys that were part of the unit in that all across the country, you have SWAT teams. Now, I'm not knocking SWAT teams. They don't have an easy job. And that's the kind of work that would make me crap my pants, to say the least, to go in and get some of these dangerous people out of there. So fine. But it's not just that. One minute, you could be that tactical team entering and taking down, as you said, a contract killer or somebody who's violent and is disturbed upstairs but has a weapon and is a danger to themselves and others. But you could be going to the water and diving and saving somebody. You could be rappelling out of a helicopter, you know, or and onto a high rise to rescue people there. You can do car accident rescues or, as you guys call them, pin jobs. So you really are a jack of all trades in the SU. You do a lot of training with the bomb squad. Um, that kind of expertise has been certainly acquired through the years and through the different experiences the unit has had. But, you know, I, I'm curious how many departments, because I remember hearing about this in the documentary I watched about you guys. Now that you mentioned the LAPD, I want to ask you this. How many departments were looking to copycat the ESU mold, given just how much you guys do and how well you do it? Well, off the top, I really couldn't tell you. I find, uh, you know, I'm currently managing a city in Florida. I've been down here since 2007 and in Dade County. And really there is a separation, you know, the police department handles tactical emergencies, the fire department handles rescue emergencies, a little overlap if there's a, you know, a situation where you wanna have, you know, EMT qualified people on the scene, if it's a hostage job or something like that, but they, they get along and, they, and that's basically how it works, tactical, stays with the uh, with the police and the uh, medical stays with the fire department. Uh, I can't say if anybody's followed our, our, you know, there's not many places like New York. I, I guess there's other places that could try it, but at the end of the day, um, it's just a lot of effort and work to do it. So I'm not sure if that's the reason why you don't see this model because everybody says the same thing. What do you mean you guys do medical like EMTs? That's, it's not unusual to have an EMT as a, in the squat in the SWAT team, but not to have everybody trained as an EMT is that's a little different. So, what's interesting, I want I want to ask you about this because I remember having this conversation with Bob Masucci, um, and he was talking about the first time you guys go up the bridges frequently, as I mentioned before. Um, ESU for the suicidal individuals who are in trouble, and we obviously feel for those people. You don't want them to take their lives; you want them to get the help they need and get better. 
Um, ESU are the people that oftentimes you see on the Brooklyn Bridge or any bridge for that matter, talking them out of that horrendous decision they're about to make. So that first time training on the bridge and going up it, tell me about what your heart was doing, because I imagine that had to be something. Uh, you know what? It was more of a thrill. I think uh, I remember someone saying, hey, someone better bring a camera because nobody's going to believe this. And uh, at that time, I, I wasn't married. So I remember showing the picture to my family, you know, showing like, hey, listen, they couldn't believe what I was doing. Uh, you know, from a police officer standpoint to be doing this was, you know, I always felt every day at work wasn't work. I enjoyed, you know, uh, it was just someplace I wanted to be. So to me, this was just another adventure, you know, um, I, while being a few jobs on the Brooklyn Bridge, I never was a person that actually had to put my hands on anybody. It usually uh, uh, one truck, the, the Manhattan truck would get often beat us to the job from a truck, which was Brooklyn North, which came out of the 90. So whoever could get to the to the person first was often a race. Um, I can remember uh, one of the a jumper job we had on the George Washington Bridge. And there was a fellow dressed up in a tuxedo up there. And it was a absolutely gorgeous day. You could see from here, like to Florida, it was unbelievable. But they had traffic backed up in both directions as far as the eye could see. And I, I, we couldn't get near the guy. And ba basically, we kind of waited him out. Eventually, he got kind of tired and hungry. And then we were able to get him. But for those four hours being up there, I, you know, we were more, you know, we we're more like enjoying the sights and saying, oh, my God, I'm glad I'm not stuck in traffic than, uh, than this poor guy. Uh, but uh, it was a successful end to the day, but not if you were on, not if you were in traffic. So some New Yorkers can be ruthless because I've seen those videos where somebody's threatening to jump in front of a train and whatnot. And they're saying, just do it. I'm going to be late for work. Like, I'm like, come on, like, you know, and that's, that's I, hate to, I hate to tell you, that's not just New York. <laughs> no, it's a lot of places, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, that's true. Yeah. That's true. So I, I'm going to dive deeper to your time in ESU in a second with a couple of interesting jobs and assignments you guys had. But I'd be remiss not to mention, of course, you retired with a pretty high rank. So a lot of guys, both in the FD that I've had on and the PD talk about studying, study, study, study. For you, how important was that? Um, you know what, actually, it, studying was interesting. As I said, my uncle was in PTS. So from a very early age, I was, I used to go and help them sign students. in. I mean, I was just a kid. And um, it really wasn't until I moved out of my house after becoming a cop, my mom, my mother had said, Hey, you know what, you should think about moving out. And I forget what the reason was, she was kind of upset with me about something. So I, I got my first apartment and I don't know what it was about that, but it kind of like really galvanized or organized my life. And um, I started to study. And at that time, nobody in my group of rookie type uh, offices were studying. We were having too much fun just being cops. Uh, and that's how it really happened for me. It, it was hard. I mean, I, I put the time in and you know, my uncle had a saying, you know, the harder you study, the luckier you get when you take these exams. And um, and it was really making that first, making the sergeants, you know, getting out of that out of that group. The um, I had to leave the unit. I wound, wound up going to, um, well, it was interesting. I made sergeant and I wound up getting dragged into the court division for a short time. And my transfer to emergency service as to be, come back as a sergeant came up and the borough commander said, no, you're not, you're not going back to emergency. I think he, I mean, he probably didn't get in when he was a cop, so he was mad. So the only way to get back or get out of the court division was to become a lieutenant. And that's what I was told. So the lieutenant's test was coming up. I studied very hard for that, but it wasn't to get to a higher rank. It was just to get out of the court division. Lo and behold, right before I got... Uh, took the test, I got transferred back to uh, emergency service. So by hook or crook, I wound up taking the lieutenant's test, being so prepared, I wound up getting taken the lieutenant's test, getting promoted right away. And at that time, I stayed in emergency service, which was fortunate for me. Uh, they were down a lot of a lot of lieutenants, and there was only two of us that were high enough to be to be even considered. So that helped me there. And then like 10, you know, right away, that was November and January, February, they gave a captain's exam. So 
I studied for six weeks and said, I'm going to give it my best. And, uh, but I really didn't care because I felt I had the best job in the city. You're a lieutenant in emergency service. Uh, and that was it. So it's kind of, it was a little bit of luck and just timing, you know, what was motivating me more was, you know, uh, you know, getting out of something that I didn't want where I wanted to be. You know, my father would have been happy if I stayed in the court division. I said like, that I didn't, I didn't, become a cop to hide out in the court division. So, and that's, that's how that happened. Yeah, you wanted the action. And I remember there was a story I read about my, the late Mike Curtin, who we'll talk about a little bit later that, you know, when he became a sergeant, he had to go out to Queens for a little bit before he went back to truck too. And he wasn't knocking his precinct. I'm sure he did what he had to do just fine. But all he would tell the uh, patrol cops, not in a demeaning way, but in an excited way, I can't wait to get back to ESU. I can't wait to get back to ESU because that's where he wanted to be, and which is I, where he... Yeah, Mike went through the training when I was uh, in charge of training. So, uh, you know, we Mike always had gray hair, which was kind of funny. Yeah. And uh, a couple of years later, you know, I, I had left as a lieutenant when I made captain and went to East to the 75 precinct. Mike was assigned to the seven truck that worked out of the 75. Funny story about Mike, uh, you know, in the 75, back in those days, it was very action packed. Guns were all over the place. Um, it was just, it was like the uh, Wild West. So I had the midnight duty, I had the midnight shift on New Year's Day, New Year's Eve. So I held the 75 precinct police officers in after midnight just for 20 minutes, you know, just for 15 minutes, because I didn't want anybody accidentally walking in and seeing a gun and could wind up getting in a shootout. Within two seconds of midnight, I hear calls for service. There's a, one of our police officers, you know, was calling for, you know, was involved in a shooting. And of course it turned out to be Mike because he was the only person I didn't tell to stay in the precinct for 15 <laughs> minutes. So I wind up, I wind up being there for like two days on that shooting and I was so mad at him, but you know, he had a way about him that you couldn't stay mad at him. But uh, that was a funny story about Mike. Brady S. U. cop who uh, we will we'll talk more about at length. Uh momentarily who really died as he lived saving others and, and being yes. selfless absolutely so you know absolutely shout out to him and his family and a foundation in his memory to the three uh 256 foundation which 3256 was his badge number so you know esu as i as i've covered before had a very very and did i say very interesting 90s because there was the bombing of the trade center in 93 there was, you know, FEMA jobs. Uh, some of the guys went out to Oklahoma City in 95. Mike Kurt was one of them. Kenny Winkler went out there too. 98, some of the guys went out to the DR for Hurricane George. Uh, I'm half Dominican, so that, uh, that hit my homeland pretty hard. And then the year before, in 97, there was that pipe bomb job out in uh, Brooklyn where, you know, the, the terrorists were trying to set him off and ESU and the bomb squad had to handle that. So I imagine you weren't there for all of them, but for the big ones, we'll talk about FEMA, we'll talk about 93. Uh, if you were in ESU uh, for 93, tell me about that day from your perspective. Oh, that was a really interesting day. Um, at that time, uh, SOD still, um, the Special Operations Division, the, ex the executive officer was Louis Anamone, who later became Chief the man. Department. Okay, yeah. Chief of Department. Again, another one of those things where serendipity puts people in your life and uh, I was in. I was a lieutenant working at emergency service down at Floyd Bennett Field, so I, I got to know him a little bit. In 1993, it was uh, when that bombing occurred. It was we were getting ready to shut down for the night, and I was the last person in the hangar. I was about to call, just to lock the door. I heard the phone ring. I walked up, and they were calling for uh, Scott packs, you know, air air bottles, and. Um, Everybody was had gone down to celebrate the retirement. Uh, we had left. We, we had a retirement dinner that night. I wound up calling calling the restaurant and ordering everybody back. We went in and then responded down to the World Trade Center. Uh, as soon as you got there, uh, Lou Anamone quickly wanted people up on the roof to repel down from helicopter and start clearing the building. So that was that was a job given to me. So myself and you know, eight other police officers, we just grabbed basically ropes, pry bars. Uh, we really weren't we, we didn't carry Scott packs uh, at the time. It was the fire really was down on the ground floor, and uh, really just started working our way. We, we got up to the to the um, to the roof, got in, and just started working our way down. Um, we started to really see people. 
probably around the 70th floor in that range. And um, mostly people, we're, we're rescue people coming up at that point. Uh, the building pretty much was clear. We had to open a few elevators that were stuck to get people out and get them on their way. Uh, but it was, it took a long time. I remember stopping at one point, picking up a phone and calling my wife and telling her, you know, just to tell her I was okay because I, I didn't come home on time. This is before cell phones were very popular or before they even were, you could have a cell phone. And she, she, she right away said, did you hear what happened at the World Trade Center? I said, no, I'm calling you from the 70th floor. I, yeah, I do know actually what happened. So uh, what a lot of people don't realize how much damage was done by that bomb. I really think if they had managed to put another truck in there, that they would have taken that building down. It was an incredibly powerful bomb. It was a miracle more people weren't killed. And uh, you had to see it to believe it. Even pictures, you can see pictures. In no way does it do tell you how much destruction was done by that, by that bomb. Because most people just see the smoke coming out of that, uh, that driveway, that entranceway into the, into the garage. It was, it was unbelievable. And uh, we were very, very fortunate that day. A lot of people could have been really killed. So, yeah, it was it was a crater essentially that was created in there, um, and multiple concourse levels were blown out. I remember somebody describing this to me from the bomb squad, um, saying that what had happened after that detonation was that the towers essentially became chimneys, almost unfortunately, just because yeah. of the, the degree of smoke that was going up there. And when you see people exiting in the archive clips, they have this black smoke around their nose, right. and that's the car smoke because so many yeah. cars were destroyed. And that bombing, um, and that was solved. If you want to hear more about the investigation into that bombing, for my listeners, if you haven't checked it out, check out volumes three through five of my interview with Don Sadawi, who I'm sure um, Mr. Watson knows well. Uh, Don uh, had a big hand in helping solve that case, and that's for my Bomb Squad mini series, Tales from the Boom Room. So the FEMA jobs. FEMA is a combination, at least the New York Task Force, of rescue firefighters and ESU cops, and I've covered before, sometimes ESU and the rescue units of the FDNY can butt heads. But regardless of that, there's no denying the fact that both are talented units and, and both are, if you're in a bind, you want them to come to you and you don't care which one comes to you just as long as you get out the bind. So being in FEMA and of course being deployed around the country, sometimes even around the world, as was the case in 98 with DR, uh, for you personally, if you were involved with that, how much of an eye opener was that? Well, I can remember uh, at the time we weren't, I feel like I was there when we got involved in FEMA or FEMA became, you know, a thing. Uh, we had an officer, uh, Mike Kaur. I don't know if that name is familiar to you, but Mike was, uh, he was one of these guys that really, you know, came in and said, hey, we got to join this thing. We got to get involved with this thing called FEMA and the task force. And at that time, I have to be honest with you, I just said, yeah, Mike, that's great. You know, just you go ahead and pursue that. And Mike was not the kind of guy to take that. You know, he's very, very driven, very motivated, dedicated. And before you knew it, we were getting involved in this thing called the FEMA task force. Um, and it was very interesting because it really did put the fire department and the police department together. And you've mentioned that there is a lot of friction and yeah, there, there definitely is. When I, when I was told by uh, Bernie Carrick, uh, Commissioner Carrick, that he was putting me in back in emergency service. And it was, I was kind of shocked actually when he told me, but his, his first, his first words were, Ron, I'm just letting you know, if your guys get into fights with the fire department, he told me not to curse. So I won't, he says, I'm going to, I'm going to kill you. And he says, and you, you, he says, and everybody you're, you're, you're going to be wrong. So I said, okay. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, I like to say the police department always takes the high road, you know, 99% of the time. Uh, but this, this unusual thing put us together and it really, each per each department had a particular thing that they were important to, or, you know, responsible for whether it was structural, the structural training, medical training, uh, you know, rigging, everybody had a, you know, had kind of a thing that they would take over and maintain and train it. Uh, and it was really good. I think it was, it was very positive. I know after the World Trade Center bombing, you know, we were seeing task forces show up from around the country and they were, they were, they were helpful only from the, from the standpoint where you had more trained people on the site 
there was a lot of people that wanted to come and help. And, you know, they were, you know, a lot of them did help, but the majority, you know, unless you're really trained to enter that type of work environment, uh, you know, I think that goes to why a lot of people, you know, we didn't have injuries or, you know, if, if we had injuries, they were minor, you know, that, that whole scene, we were fortunate nobody got killed, you know, in that effort to recover and to try to rescue people. So, um, you know, that, that was the ultimate, I had left emergency. So a lot of their deployments, I was, I was not there. I could just read about it like everybody else, but my, my partner, uh, uh, Mike Lamantia, my old partner who became a, an emergency cop, he, he deployed, I think down to, uh, down to Santo Domingo. Brian Lawson's our guest here for volume six of the men inside the NYPD's emergency service unit here in the Mike, the New Haven podcast episode 119. I am Mike Cologne. Uh, so that being said, you know, talking about, of course, these jobs and, and the nature of them, I think what's good about it is that, you know, the NYPD tweeted out recently, um, during the flooding of Ida, in which numerous people unfortunately lost their lives, a clip of the NYPD and FDNY working together for a water well rescue. Somebody had fallen down a drain of some sort and they got him out. And the good thing about that is that, listen, friction aside, if an FDNY rescue guy turns to an ESU cop and says, I need this, he's not going to look at him like he has two heads because the thing is, they have the same training. They know what to do. The only difference between the two units is that, well, they they carry guns in ESU. FDNY does not. But if they're going to go to a scene, whatever that kind of scene may be, since you're trained in the same things, you can work hand in hand. Because I think most people realize whatever pride you may have in your department, we're not here to fight. We're here to help these people, whoever these people are, whatever bind they're in. I have to tell you that from the time I came into emergency service, that was one of the things that we were always trained in. And that really went every year, you know, throughout my career in emergency was always you know, if we show up and the, if the, the, the fire department was there, offer help, whatever they needed, we'd assist them. And, uh, you know, generally they would do the same, you know. So I'd like, you know, I know a lot of it is, uh, a lot of it's blown up. I mean, listen, there's, it's more of, sometimes I think it came down to certain people had a personality thing. So, but that, that was controllable. Uh, um on the job, like when things were really, you needed help where, you know, when it was, you, you had a working job, as we say, um, it really didn't matter. You know, they, it, 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 you know, a hand is a hand when you need a help, when you need help. So yeah. I have to say my experience has always been pretty positive with the fire department, you know, not always, but most of the time. That was the FDNY. Of course, like I said, I have a mini series with those guys and they're great too. I mean, hey, listen, terrorism is terrorism. It doesn't matter the uniform as I'm sure you and I can both agree on. So we'll get to the events of September 11th in a moment. But first, when Carrick puts you back in ESU, you know, this is, it's a job that's made easier by the fact that you have so many great people working under you that have great control of the squads. I mean, I mentioned Lampkin, a guy like Mike Curtin, Rod Gillis, John Coughlin, all these guys are great, great leaders. So that part's fine. But obviously, it's still a tall task because you have 400 plus cops. You have an entire city of 8 million people to cover and you got 10 trucks to do it. So when you're in charge now, what is Ron Watson's game plan to not change anything? I don't I don't think much about ESU needs to be changed or going about it just fine, but making sure the mission continues to run smoothly. Well, you know, uh, I think I, I, I think I was the first person to come back to emergency as the, the commanding officer. There was a few guys that came back as captains, as execs. The, the, the benefit for me was, and I always said it was, there was no learning experience for me. As a cop in emergency and going through, a lot of the commanding officers that came through were really coming through. For, they weren't, they were coming for a short amount of time. Uh, and I would say if you had no experience in our, the rescue world and SWAT, it takes you some time to understand what we do. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of our bosses had no idea of the capabilities that we had. So sometimes they were a little nervous, you know, to say, hey, listen, we got to rig a guy on a Stokes basket and take him down 200 feet. They would be very, to be, you know, nervous about that. Are you sure you can do it? Or, hey, we're going to go in, devise a plan to go after a guy with a gun. We're going we're gonna to distract him and come in this way, you know, like when you're coming up with a plan. 
Uh, the advantage I think for me was, you know, I called, I went down to see one of the trucks, opened it up, went through the, we call it the load, what, what was on the truck. I wanted to see any new equipment that had been, had been come into the unit that I wasn't aware of. And I was ready to go like that day, you know, let's, let's go. Um, I, you know, my fear of what we could do and what not we could do. I didn't have that fear. You know, if I needed a helicopter, I just called one. I called, you know, I called for a ship. There was no hesitation. You know, hey, can I, should I do this or not do it? You know, I knew what, I knew what our capabilities were. And I think that was a really big advantage. Sometimes it scared people because, uh, you know, I didn't need to check with people to do things. I just did them. And uh, uh, part of the training also going up, and I have to say, I always rely back to it. And it goes back to right back to Floyd Benefield. They always told us when you get on the scene, everybody's going to be when a cop gets on the scene, everybody's looking to that cop. When now and you get used to that. But when you're an emergency cop, now you're you're your rank and file are looking at you to know what you're doing. So, you know, if your training is good and you keep your eyes open and you you're, you learn what you're supposed to do or how to do it. The other thing that was critical was being calm in crisis situations. And I, I really feel like that was a benefit that really I took really to my to heart. Because when things are going bad, and during 9-11 was a good example, things were, you know, couldn't be going worse. You know, many times I, I feared that I wasn't coming home because things that were going on on the ground that were just insane. Uh, you had to be, because people are looking at you, your sergeants, your lieutenants, where are we going? How are we going to fall back? What are we doing? You know, stay calm and show that, you know, this is, we got this. I, you know, this is what we're going to do. Listen to people telling you what's coming, what they're, they're experiencing and that like show panic. As soon as you do that, I think you lose your, your edge. And, uh, you know, thank God I've been able to maintain that most, you know, most of the time. Uh, and that's, that's part of it. And, you know, you mentioned Lampkin and Rodney Gillis. Rodney Gillis was a, was a sergeant for me. I knew Rodney. Um, he was one of those guys, like, you know, he's, he, he took over my rookies in the seven, seven precinct in Crown Heights. And, uh, he was the kind of leader that these kids would have followed him anywhere, anywhere. I mean, he was just that good. And, uh, I was so hard, you know, I was so happy when he went back to emergency service. It, I hated it because I lost him from my precinct, but I was very happy for emergency service because they were getting that kind of, that really great leadership. And, uh, you know, fortunate for me, emergency service is loaded with very good thinkers, logical thinkers, guys, people who don't panic and are able to assess the situation. You know, I needed, I would never rely on somebody on the scene other than an emergency cop to tell me what equipment I needed, what was going on. Cause a lot of people do panic, you know, and you would get these crazy things coming over the, you know, the division radio and I would be, okay, that's great. Um, tell, give me one, the first unit, you know, first the E truck is on the scene and I would get that assessment. And often it was a lot, you know, they could, they could calm the two officers could calm things down quickly. So, uh, that 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 was that's one of the fortunate things I had, and uh, so the the leap for me wasn't really that great to go back. It was just you know I was so thrilled to be back. Um, you know, it was, it was just for me it was a you know once in a lifetime. And I, when I told Carrick, I thought I was getting kicked out of the Bronx. I was up uh, assigned to the Bronx at the time, and I was just told the boss wants to see you. Just where are you? And I say I was literally on the Cross Bronx Expressway, and he goes. Just come straight to the office. Don't say anything to anybody. And I said, oh, God, what did I do? And uh, he just said, I want you back in emergency. And I, I always said, I can't believe you're telling me that because uh, I never thought that was going to happen. You know, so that's how for me. And one uh, aside on Gillis, you know, there was a tribute clip made to him and some of the cops that worked with him were talking about him. And uh, I don't know his name. I know he was sitting next to Madeline Lawrence, who I'd love to get on the show. Madeline, Madeline, Madeline. I mean, what a, what an interesting perspective 
she must have as a female in the SU. And that's my mom's name too, Madeline. Uh, so I'm a little partial in that sense. But no, you know, one of the cops that was sitting next to her was saying, you know, he asked him one time, Rod, how do you like an emergency? He's like, tell you the truth, great. Because of that reason, he just, he, he was one of those guys that really loved uh, the grunt work and loved the action. And everybody describes him as a great boss. So I'm, I'm glad that you- Yeah, he had, he, had, he had a great sense of humor too. I already had a great smile too. That you know, was, yep. was once described could light up Manhattan. So that morning, um, you know, nothing, as I often say, nothing could prepare even the most experienced first responder for what came. Uh, you were, you, had, you know, you had the SOD radio going, special operations division. And then all, all of a sudden, as we all know, first plane hits and that sets off uh, a, a tragic, tragic morning. Uh, from your perspective, uh, take me through I'm sure you've heard pretty much the same from most people. I was home and my, my wife told me it looks like a plane hit the World Trade Center. And I, you know, in my mind, I was like, all right, better get going. Uh, I go down, I went downstairs, turned on the TV and I could see this huge fire. And I said, Jesus, this is gonna, we're going to be there all day. And again, I'm not assuming, I'm assuming it was just a, an accident. I get in the car and I don't live that far from Floyd Bennett. You know, I was able to get there really, really fast because it was an election day. There's nobody on the road. And uh, I was I almost went directly to the site only because I said, you know what, because of 1993 and being there and how long it was, I said, you know what, I better throw a uniform on because we're going to be here all day and I don't want to be fighting with people. Who are you? So I swung in. There, I picked up uh, a Lieutenant Larry Saris. We're both driving in now. And at that point, the second plane hit. And uh, I just, you know, at that point, you realized, you know, when the chief of the department was on the on the on SOD and he, he said, Central, where the, you know, the F are these planes coming from? He says, we're under attack. And that's, you know, I think about that. And every time I say it, I get chills. And I, you know, I looked at my, at, at Larry and I said, like, this ain't good, man. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm cleaning it up, but I said, this, this isn't good. And then uh, Esposito goes, you know, notify the military we're under attack. And uh, it seemed like really quickly, they said, Cent uh, Central says, all right, chief of department, uh, chief, uh, the, the military has been, the Pentagon's been notified, please be advised they've been hit too. They were under attack. And that's when it really like hits you. This is, this is, this is real. It gets game on. And uh, I think she said, you know, there's another plane possibly inbound to New York. We don't have eyes on it. You know, so this is all going through your mind, coming through the battery tunnel. Uh, you pull onto the street and, you know, I've been to a plane crash, so I know what body parts look like. They're all over West Street. And, uh, you know, just pulled right up and started to, you know, go into the building. I, I was just standing there. And uh, at one point, I hear an explosion and it was like very close to me. And I, I didn't know, I, th it was, I thought it was a bomb and it turned out to be somebody who had jumped. So for, for that short time, I, you know, I told uh, Larry, I said, move, just, just move the car back. I said, this is not a good place. And kind of where there was an over, there was a pedestrian overpass over West Street. And, uh, and in that time, the, the, the first building goes. And it was just kind of like, if you were in the right place at the right time, we all dove underneath the car or truck. And uh, it was about a 20 second rumble. Then it got very silent. And, you know, you couldn't see and anything like that. It took about you could all of a sudden you could hear the, the alarms on the Scott packs going off. That's how quiet it was. You could hear it all over. As the as the as the first cloud kind of lifts, you could see that you know what had happened, and we didn't really didn't know what happened until you heard it. You know the building is down, so we just started calling to you know get out of the building, just get out. You know I don't care where you are, get out. So most most people got out a lot of some of them didn't obviously and uh um i remember just saying to guys listen we got to fall back we got to get to the river you know whatever you can drive some of the trucks were damaged i said i don't care just drive them on the, whatever you can do if you can't drive the truck because some of them were damaged just pull out whatever we can and just drag it down the street 
And that's kind of what we did. And in a very short, you know, in a short time later, the other building went. Uh, I actually thought we were all going to die in a fireball because the gas lines had ruptured. And that's something that was so powerful in the air. You could smell gas. And uh, there were cars that had got set on fire in a parking lot across the street. They were on fire. And I said, you had all this gas in the air. And I'm like, oh, God, you know, <laughs> we were all going to get incinerated. But we managed to pull as many people as we could down to uh, down to the river. The second building went. And it was at that time I just tried to gather up everybody and say, this is this is our plan of action. You know, this is what we're going to do. This is going to be our staging area. Uh, let's start getting a count of people. And then first, initially, we thought we, we couldn't make contact with 50 people. Uh, and that's honestly what I thought was, you know, we had lost. Uh, turned out to be 14. By the end of the day, we pretty much had a hard count of that. And, uh, you know, it was just kind of just, you know, not listening to what was the bad news. It was like, hey, we got to we, we got to pull it together and just get organized. My, my thing was I, I just didn't want to lose anybody out in the site because I'm sure most people have told you that site was unbelievably difficult to get around. It was 16 acres. You couldn't go across it. You needed a Scott pack in the, you know, initially for many, for, for a long time, because you, it was just on fire. You know, it was a, it was a fire burning and uh, you know, that was it. I, you turn around, it was like 24 hours had gone by and uh, that was it. My, uh, not much to say. <laughs> I understand. And there were, as you said, 14 in total. Uh, Sergeant Coghlan was in tower number two, as was Sergeant Gillis leading their guys. Um, and then Mike Curtin, he, had, he was not in tower one, as I've explained before on the show previously. He, he, I remember Bill Bury, not to me, but in a separate clip on YouTube talking about how there had been some separation and that Mike Curtin wanted to get all his guys together. Um, just to maintain order. And so they all united up in the customs house, Billy Berry, Mark DeMarco, um, and Mike and John DeLera. And they were with the guys from the bomb squad, as I've explained before. And, and sadly, Mike ended up dying in the customs house with uh, DeLera and uh, Claude Richards. But, you know, well, these are guys. Yeah, you know, Bill Bury, you know, after some time had passed, he brought me back to where he was, you know, in that in that customs house and a part of the building had come down and really when i tell you you stretched your arm out the building got cut and everybody on that side was gone i mean he literally you could see you'd see their hands because they couldn't see at the time yeah, they were feeling their way yeah, yeah and i just remember looking at where he's you could see his handprints and there was nothing there it was all everything was gone 10-story building gone right to, down to the ground uh, you know, it was, it was really unbelievable. So I can tell you. And ahead of it now is, is the, the rebuilding process. And as I said before, and I thank you for sharing that experience with me, I always like to get the experiences um, just to make sure that, you know, you remember just how hard it was for first responders during that time. But, you know, you, you can't replace these 14 individuals. And to this day, they never have been and they never will be. No. That much can be said. But, you know, although, you know, you can never really get it back to the level it was before that day, there has to be a level at least close to what it was prior. A lot of people volunteered, but really the entire SOD division uh, was in a time of transition because, you know, a lot of the guys in February of 02 from ESU went to the bomb squad because the bomb squad needed more guys. There were down 12 guys, never retired, and, and Detective Richards got killed. You know, ESU now, because of these absences, needs more guys. So, you know... Talk about as you were in your last year before you retired in 02, which we'll talk about momentarily, the process of trying to put this unit back to a, a, not a fully operational level, but a, a somewhat operational level to replenish the ranks. You know, a lot of the, 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 the kind of pressure that was on the unit was just incredible because you think about manning the site, which was incredible and um it was really that alone was a feat in itself. Um, we also had to cover patrol. You also had, you know, an endless 
string of people, dignitaries that were coming into New York to come, you know, come see it. And, you know, the president, the vice president, um, you know, they, that's a detail that we cover with Secret Service when they come into the, into the city. Throw in anthrax. That was another thing that popped up, you know, um, that anthrax attack and coming up with a response plan to deal with that. All these things were happening, you know, something simple as opening up, you know, when Yank, the Yankee game, when they, when they opened up that, that uh, they started to play baseball again, all these things were just tremendous strain on the unit. Uh, initially, it was thought we should come up with a terrorism squad. And uh, I remember being resistant to it. And, you know, one thing about emergency, there was always a fantastic group of people looking to come in. I mean, one of the things that, you know, was, uh, you know, is a pleasure being the CEO of emergency. You have the best cops who are always trying to get in and you, you're getting the best of the best. Um, the terrorism squad that they talked about just to respond to possible terrorist activity, we really already had it. We had a thing called the A-team, which really was um, brought back to help but all the search warrants in the uh, with narcotics and all these things that we used to do, we, we had stopped doing it. We brought it back. So we had this team of guys that would rotate the A team and it would be like 14 cops at a time. You would spend six weeks there, you know, a month, two months, and you would be doing warrants all day. So you would be, I said, that's your, your terrorist team. What they're doing, they're ready to go. They're highly trained. But, you know, not that we wouldn't have another terrorist attack, but to be like the Maytag repairman, you, you never know when that's going to happen. You want the A-team, they're sharp, they're ready to go. All our guys are active. That's who you need to respond and can respond. So don't, don't overreact. I said, I don't need 20 guys who I'm just going to train to do search warrants. I already have them here. Let me put them into the training, the training, uh, the academy. And fortunately, they... They, they were, they listened and that's kind of how it went. But uh, like you said, the natural transition, a lot of guys from emergency service did gravitate to the bomb squad. Usually they were a little back in my day, they were a little older. Um, although, you know, the duty calls and a lot of them did, you know, they did go to, to the bomb squad, which was really good. It's always nice to have that, you know, that connectivity, which we, which we maintained. So uh I don't know. That's that's kind of how we did it. Uh, the training was not, we didn't skimp on training. Uh, and like I said, a lot of the guys that that came in, guys and girls, I should say, uh, you know, they they were really fantastic. You know, you never you never would see a class of there were no nobody couldn't pull that weight, put it to you that way. And they're still like that today, I believe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a few more things here. And I've had a great time talking with you. I'm glad that you're here. Um, when you retired in 2002, were you already thinking about it prior to that day or did that day just make you say, okay, uh, time to go? No, no, actually, it's really funny. I, it's hard to believe it's almost 20 years I'm out. Uh, um, it was just really one of those things. I had no intention of leaving the department. Um, as a courtesy to the mayor where I lived, he asked me to interview for this position as town administrator. I took the you know, I took the interview as a courtesy because um, we used to bring emergency service equipment out for uh, police day. Because, and uh, you know, so he he got my name and he said we'd like the interview. I went for the interview, and uh, what happens is, uh, of course, the job you don't want they offer it to you. And uh, I was supposed to be promoted to chief that the same at the roughly at the same time. And I really was praying, praying on it, that God send me a message what to do, because I didn't really want to leave. I'd still be in the police department. Now I'm not, you know, I'm not old enough to retire, you know, to be pushed out for my age. And, uh, you know, at the very last minute, you know, the, the, the chief promotion went to somebody else. And I said, you know what, maybe that's God telling me, you know, try, try this. And, uh, you know, looking back, my wife uh, was not well at the time. She was suffering from a uh, very serious lung, lung problem. She wound up eventually getting a lung transplant. Uh, and my three daughters were, you know, 
two in grammar school, one just starting high school. And, you know, with this police job, being a precinct commander, which I spent a good part of my career in, you know, that's not an eight day, that's not an eight hour a day job. That's a 16 hour day job if you're doing it. And, um, you know, it was nice to spend, you know, to kind of like retool and spend that time, like really with my daughters and my family. Uh, and it was, it was kind of good too. My, you know, my, she did get the lung transplant and, you know, we, we did have some quality, you know, that quality time, you know, together. And I would never trade that. I miss the job every day. It's not a day. It's just not a week goes by. I don't have a dream where I'm like either on an emergency truck or, you know, somebody's yelling at me to do something. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm always going to be a, a, a retired cop. And that's how I introduce myself. I never tell people what I, you know, my rank. I always say I'm a police officer. I was a cop in New York. And that's how I'd like to be, you know, known as. On that note, we'll get to the concluding segment now. It's been a really, really uh, great conversation. Like I said, I'm glad you came on. A lot of people were excited when I said you were coming on, and it's uh, definitely been as advertised. So, but this is, it's rapid fire. Five hit and run questions for me, five answers from you. And are you ready? Oh, I'm going to try. All right. So if not for the NYPD, what other career could you have seen yourself pursuing and enjoying? Uh, before I became a cop in NYPD, I was working for Season Roebuck. I was there three years. Uh, I was moving up. They were making me an assistant manager and I absolutely loved where I worked. I probably, if you know, CS and see and Roebuck went out of business, but I'd probably be where I probably would have been working for them. I enjoy, I enjoyed the, the contact with people. I think mean, that's why I like being a cop too. You know, you always have that interaction. So second funniest colleagues you ever worked with. Oh, God, you know, emergency service is just loaded with characters. Uh, the police department in general is, is characters. Uh, two that jump out to me would be Tommy Urbanski and Tommy DeCostanza, the two Toms. Uh, one was Italian, one was Polish. They, you never knew what you would walk into when you came to work. Uh, I was a sergeant in six truck when I really got to know them well. Uh, they were scary how funny they were. And... Uh, you know, one was nicknamed the Antichrist. Uh, the other one was the nose. If you knew, the, if you saw them, you'd know what I was talking about. My, yep. uh, I know. So they they used to host a they used to host a dinner, the two the two Toms dinner in Brooklyn, and you had to be like at first it was a small event, then it became a big event, and it was like, did you get invited to the two Toms? And uh, they they were so funny. I mean, and as much as they they were partnered together they would always be fighting. So, and making, you know, like really like arguing with each other, which was really the show. You'd just sit there drinking coffee and, and listen to them argue back and forth. So, uh, and they were always doing crazy things too. <laughs> like one day we had a new guy assigned to the truck. I came into the garage, I opened up the door and there's the rookie. He's in a, a jump, jump net and it was rigged to the ceiling and he was like tied up, couldn't get out. And he's just staring down at me. And I just looked up and I said, are you the new guy? And he goes, yeah. I said, okay, nice to meet you. And I just went upstairs, <laughs> had my coffee. Now everybody was waiting to see what I was going to say. So I waited for about an hour and I said, hey, is anybody going to let the guy down from the, from the ceiling? And, uh, you know, that, that's the kind of stuff that they were, they would be pulling. So they, they were, they were my funny guys. I'll have to try and get uh, at least one of them on. Uh, third, if this is not clean, you can say it has because I know some of them might not be, but funniest call you ever responded to. Man, some of the funniest calls are some of the tra most tragic calls, unfortunately, and, you know, cop human being what it is. So I'll tell you one that wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't even an emergency. I was working with a, you know, in with my partner and we came on an aided case. It was a heart attack. So we went up in six story walk up we get up there and it was a little jewish lady and um her husband the husband had had a heart attack with you know difficulty breathing so we you know we call for an ambulance and you know the the you know it's like a stereotype there oh i'm having a heart attack I, I don't feel good so you know that just kind of the way she spoke was kind of funny and then all of a sudden the husband goes, you know, we had called for the bus and then she, she turns around and she goes, Oi, I'm having a heart attack too. And she falls back into the couch. And I don't know why it struck me so funny. I, Me and my partner look at each other. Now we're going to call for 
a call for another bus. So we call, you know, we put, we put you say, you know, Adam, Adam on the air, you know, and, and after that, we couldn't control laughing. So, you know, they kept saying, okay, Adam, this central, what? And we were, you know, we're trying to control your, your, you get the giggles, I guess. So it took a while before we could say, we need another bus. Uh, and so that's the, my clean version of a, of a funny story for me. But uh, there were many more that probably, you know, <laughs> Maybe yeah, they're maybe not so G-rated, but I appreciate that one. Fourth favorite bar or restaurant in New York City? Uh, Peter Luger's. And there's uh, one that was very close to where I lived for a while in Forest Hills, uh, the family restaurant. I believe they're still there. Um, we live I live behind it. I, we live, me and my wife live behind there. And it was brutal on, because we wound up eating there a lot because the, the, the restaurant, you could smell the, 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 uh, the food being cooked. And, uh, you know, no matter how hard you tried, it was hard to stay out of that restaurant. So to me, that's one of, that's a pretty good place. Forest Hills, I love because it's home to uh, two of my favorite characters, the Ramones and Spider-Man. So <laughs> love, okay. love, for, love Forest Hills. So there you go. Fifth and finally, you know, given all your experiences, uh, 21 years in total, what advice would you give to any? I mean, we had 404 new cops come on the job yesterday. If you could talk to one of them, what would you tell them? You know, I remember when I started, it was so exciting. This is 1981. I remember a couple of older cops driving up to me and telling me, Hey kid, the job sucks. Why did you become a cop? And looking back, you know, in 1981, you go back 25 years, you're talking about somebody that was, you know, came on in 60 or maybe in the fifties. And I remember at that time, how wonderful it was. And I, looking back, it was, you know, I, I don't have any bad, you know, things to say about it. Um, looking now, I, I often think, I said, what would I say to that young cop? Because I do have young cops that are coming into, you know, where I work. I'm in charge of the police department. And the last six or seven police officers were all New York City police officers that are coming in. Young guys, really fantastic. Um and I always, you know, I always tell them the same thing, you know, any cop, be careful, watch your back, keep your mouth shut, you know, keep your eyes open, you know, not every cop does everything the same. Learn, pick, take the things that are good from the ones, you, you'll know what they are. When you, you, when you work with good cops or guys that do things well, you pick up, take those things, the things that don't, that don't make sense or stupid, don't, you know, don't, don't, don't copy those. Uh, look out for each other and uh, make sure you go home at the end of the night. I said, cause that's really important. Uh, my hat goes off to anybody who's wearing a badge today. I don't care where you are. It is, you know, honestly, you know, I never hesitated ever telling anybody. I said, if you want a great career, become a new, new York city cop. Um, you'll never have no, no two days will ever be the same. You'll, you'll, become part of a team or a family that will take care of you for your life. Um, I still feel that way. I just don't know like how they keep it together. Cause I, I just don't, we didn't have to worry about, you know, body cams and everybody trying to take you down. So my hats are off to them and, you know, I just wish them best and stay, just stay safe. I echo those sentiments completely. So that concludes what it's been. A great episode of the show. I mean, I'm really, really fortunate to get the chance to talk with such an eclectic group of people. You know, I was talking with the news reporter last episode, and here I am talking with somebody who ran one of the more elite units that the NYPD has, if not the most elite unit that the NYPD has, for what has now become volume six of a mini series that I started on a whim, but it's turning into something real good, and I'm glad I'm doing it. So before we go, if there's any plugs or shout outs you want to give to anybody or anything, go right ahead. No, listen, I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, I, I, I was surprised when you reached out. Um, I don't do, you know, I don't talk too many too much about my past. A lot of people here don't even, you know, you know, have no idea what I really did in a prior life, you know, until they, you know, they talk to me or somebody tells them. So uh, uh, it's good. It's good to talk, you know, once in a while to people who I'm sure mostly police officers are watching. So my shout out to me, all my friends in emergency service, and thanks for taking care of me. <laughs> so. And uh, my shout outs is always, well, as, as Inspector Wasson says to everybody that's going out there right now doing the work, and all the emergency guys that I've talked to to this point, to you, to John Lampkin, Kenny Winkler, Bob Masucci, 
and Anthony Lisi and to everybody else in the future. Hopefully I can get you on and hear your stories too. So uh, coming up on the Mike Canavan podcast, Monday will be volume seven of another mini series, the best of the bravest interviews with the FKNY's elite, Tim Brown, retired in uh, 19 years uh, with the FDNY from 1995 to 2014. He'll be here, so it should be a good show. Tuesday, Yal Balter, interesting lady, uh, native of Israel. She ran the NYPD's uh, social media accounts for a while from 2014 to right up around the end of 2019. So it'll be interesting talking with her about her experiences uh, as well. It's an eclectic mix. There's more guests in the works. I don't want to say who, but I'm excited to share them with you when I can. In the meantime, have a great weekend, everyone. And on behalf of retired NYPD Inspector Ron Watson, this has been the EMEN inside the NYPD's emergency service unit. I'm Mike Cologne, and we will see you next time. Take care.